Hi everyone, we're very lucky today to be joined by Trent Woodhill. Uh, Trent's uh, probably one of our more understated guys in cricket. He's, he was in one of the most influential uh, people in English cricket last year. He's worked in all the major tournaments around the world with national teams, with top players, Steve Smith, Vera Coley, Chris Gale, Kevin Pidson. The list goes on. He's worked in, um, in, in batting, fielding, spin bowling, and uh, all our top guys. So give, it'll give us a great uh, look into the world of cricket and uh, be really helpful for any cricket fans. Hope you enjoy. Thank you very much for joining us. How are you doing? Well, thanks, Dan. Great to catch up with you. Yeah, you too, mate. How are things uh, over in Australia, mate, with the coronavirus? Are things looking okay? Or yeah, it's, I think I think we could be heading into a second wave uh, or a little spot fires. But Melbourne, Melbourne's struggling a little bit. Sydney have had a few cases overnight, so the whole nation's a bit jumpy, like the rest of the world, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a great change. Would you think that things will be okay for cricket-wise when it gets round to the season? I hope so. The, the WBBL announced their fixtures uh, yesterday and the BBL as well. So from October 17 all the way through to about the 7th of Feb, there's, there's non-stop BBL action, both men and women. Um, hoping India tour this year for, for three ma or four match test series. So... There's a lot riding on, on this summer for, for Australian cricket, as there, there is for English cricket with West Indies, Pakistan, and hopefully Australia. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, Trent, well, we, we'll, um, we'll, we'll crack on with uh, a little bit about the story of Trent Woodhill, which is quite an amazing story. Um, for the viewers who don't know, uh, in terms of Trent's coaching career, we've got Surrey, Kent, uh, New South Wales, Victoria, Melbourne Stars, Delhi Daredevils, Royal Challengers, Bangalore, Pakistan, New Zealand, and I'm sure there'll be some we've missed off there. Um, I think it's okay. I think I've got to start with Australia as well. Always <laughs> yeah, that might be worth mentioning Australia. <laughs> um, Trent, Trent is lived well. He was named one of the most influential um, people in the English game last year, which I know will embarrass him greatly. Um, and yeah. we, we did have a laugh about. Um, a real genuinely modest guy, got an incredible CV and, and reputation for the game. Now, I hope, that, I hope, that, I hope, um, I hope you'll pay me for that after Trent, by the way. Yeah, yeah tricks in the mouth. <laughs> um, Trent, you didn't, you didn't actually play first past cricket. So, you, you mean you have achieved great things in the game, but so how, how did it sort of come about for you? I know you got a sports science degree. What sort yep. of, what was your break into the game? I loved it as a kid and, and played first grade cricket over here for two pretty big clubs in Sutherland and, and Bankstown. So I played with Glenn McGrath here when he first came on the scene and then moved to Bankstown and played with the War Brothers and there's a host of good players there. Um, at the time, uh, cricket was pretty strong and, and I, I probably wasn't as dedicated um, or as talented, but, but probably from the mental aspect of the game, I think that was... That was my biggest challenge at the time was, was mental capacity to perform week in, week out or every game or under pressure. And so I, I did a sports science degree, played a season in uh, Brentwood for, so in the Essex League for Brentwood and came back to the degree and realised I, I wanted to go back to the UK and play because I enjoyed that. And I ended up going over 94, 95, 97 and kept coming back to the UK. And then what I realised is, the best way to keep coming back to the UK was actually um, through coaching rather than playing. And um, I, I had a little break for the game for about three years, from about, about 97 to 2000, which was really good. It did some, um, some other work, which put me in good stead to work out what I actually wanted to do. And gotten back involved with a, um, a great club over here called Sydney University and ended up coaching Sydney University and, and felt I had a knack for coaching. Um, I always found even when I was playing, I was more interested in other people's success or performances than I was my own and was really curious the way people did that and how they succeeded and why some succeeded and why others didn't and, and how talent wasn't always just what somebody looked like. It was that capacity to repeat good performance under pressure. And so I found myself at, at Sydney University as a, maybe as a 31-year-old um, you know, who was starting their coaching career and I had Kevin Peterson as my overseas player. 
So that was a, that was a really good good time. Uh, Kevin and I became very close. He was maybe 22, and um, we we won the the competition for the first time. Sydney University won a first grade premiership in 89 years, and that kick started things. And I was doing the same thing in in uh, Northern Ireland, and then then Scotland, uh, the Grange Club in Edinburgh, um, and then just found found that I had an opportunity to to work for Surrey County Cricket Club with Steve Rickson as coach. And it was, a, it was a really good experience at County Cricket. That was, in, that was in 2005. And I had um, James Ormond and Graham Thorpe, Mark Butcher, um, three guys who, who took me under their wing in different capacities to teach me a little bit about uh, the game of cricket from, a, from an English perspective, from a county perspective. And, and it also from an individual perspective, it, it really got rid of the romance side of cricket. That cricket isn't as glamorous as what a lot of people expected it to be. And someone who hadn't played first class cricket, I just assumed it was it was glamorous and it's something that I wanted to do. And that gave me a good grounding to realise that it's people people skills that are really important. Um, you know, then then came back home and had the opportunity to work with New South Wales in a youth capacity and and sort of was really lucky and that it was a golden era for New South Wales cricket. I ended up spending time with people like Steve Smith and David Warner, Stark, Hazelwood, Pat Cummins, Adam Zampa, Nick Maddinson, and, and then started doing some batting coaching with the, the New South Wales team. Yeah. And it just snowballed. It happened really quickly, whereas I'd spent eight months working with David Warner um, one-to-one on his batting. We've, we've just found a chemistry that worked. And with that, um, he exploded on the scene with his, his um, 89 off, you know, 50 balls against South Africa at the MCG. And, and with that, he was, he was then picked up by Delhi Daredevils in the IPL in, in 2010. They wanted his batting coach. They wanted somebody to come in to, to do something a little bit different. And yeah. um, I got a call from Greg Shipper, who, who was the Sydney Sixers coach, former Melbourne Stars coach, was the current Delhi Daredevils coach. And he um, basically interviewed me over the phone to see whether... Yeah, he wanted me along in his in his stable, and I think he asked me three questions, and, and that was it. And then next thing you know, I'm on a plane to South Africa, and and ten IPLs later, um, you know, and and time with New Zealand and Pakistan and and New South Wales and Victoria and Melbourne. It, it just sort of I don't, I don't know where the, that time's gone, but it, I was I was lucky enough to, to to be in a lot of different de- dressing rooms from different nationalities, different cultures, different teams, different franchises, and it. It was a great grounding for to have a capacity to understand what people need to succeed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you probably were one of the well travelled uh, people in cricket. I would say, without a doubt, uh, at, at still a young age as well. Um, in, in terms of, I mean, you've obviously again incredible. You, you're batting coach, you're a spin bowling coach, fielding coach, list manager, pretty much you know consultant to one of the one of the going to be hopefully one of the largest tournaments in the world um, also. But, and I know you've, you've put a lot of research, yet, you know, I know people mentioned the, the money ball side of things, um, and you obviously look at other sports outside of cricket and baseball. And So what's, um, what, what sort of impact do you think that has? Where do you think that can go in the future for other American sports or other from, from other countries? What, what sort of... Yeah, what, what sort of impact can that have going forward? So when, when I was at the Delhi Daredevils, I was doing an analyst role for a little while and and I found that I was being asked questions in the middle of the match to change the course of the match. And basically I was putting my hands in the air and saying, well, I, I can't change the course of the match. And anything I give you is hindsight. Um, and I found that a lot of the analytical stuff that we were getting at the time was was page and page and page of stuff that, I actually couldn't train or coach the coaches or coach the players in, and it was too just too much information. Um, so I, I felt that I needed to streamline that side of things, and and I was lucky that um, I came across Dan Vittori in, in uh, so it was two thousand nine in, in the IPL, and we became very close. And he introduced me into baseball, and and I started becoming a, a big fan of baseball. And the more shows I watched on baseball, the more I realised that. They, they went into a lot of depth around stats, but they could justify every, every stats. And there was still the old school mentality around, you know, stats isn't just baseball, there's more to it than that. And, and there is, there's that human element and human capacity that you can't actually uh, code or you can't watch or you can't graph. But it was, it was interesting how 
they they could really have matchups. And so I started to to look at that in in the IPL, especially around how can we we match things together and and have a have a list that could cope with what was in front, what was in the IPL, what was with surfaces, and um, and obviously it's been taken now to a, a high degree with. With a couple of companies, notably, notably uh, Crickfish, who are doing a marvelous job with you know, Phil Oliver and, and Freddie Wild, Ben Jones, etc. Um, and then there's other independent people like Dan Weston, who who have now developed a really good um, niche and importance around uh, analysing players. Um, yeah, the, the next step is always marrying the old school or the or the human element with the statistical element, and yeah. that's if one gets ahead of the other. Well, one doesn't respect the other, then it will fall down regardless of how, how right you think you are or how right you are. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to ask you about Trent. Um, it's something we've spoke about a lot uh, over, over, the, over time. So you, you get a guy who's got the most sensational stats, looks fantastic, but you've got a question mark on his character. In fact, not a question mark. You know he's perhaps not the best guy in the world. Where would you go with that? Um, and also, what, what sort of Weighting would you give of import? I know we're both important, but which would you perhaps give a bit of more importance to in terms of character, in terms of stats? I think it's still, you've got to marry them together. And, and what becomes important is then coaching in itself and leadership. So Owen Morgan, uh, Kane Williamson, Brendan McCullum, Danny Vittori, these guys as captains and leaders, and Stephen Fleming, they, they were really good at marrying uh, characters together. So somebody didn't get an opportunity to become a bad character or a bad egg because those captains were very good at, at um, addressing that and ha- letting people thrive. Um, and then there's other coaches and captains who aren't so good at dealing with characters. They want everybody the same because it's not that they feel threatened. They just don't know how to get the best performance out of them. So I, as much as, I mean, as someone as a list manager, it's, it's my job to put the list together. It's the coach's job and the captain's job to get the best out of that list. And if they have a problem with somebody on that list, they, they need to have, they need to have I've researched or, or looked at every possible way to, to get the best out of them before you, you push them aside. Because talent is still what's going to win you more cricket matches than, than someone with good character whose stats aren't as good. Yeah, sure, sure. And um, in terms of the high performance managers, which are obviously becoming uh, very prevalent uh, around the world, and you're probably used to them in, in all facets of the game. England, England, perhaps a little bit behind, maybe in some respects. Um, some obviously, some counties take it on, some, some not so much. How, how vital, how important is a high performance or sort of or director of cricket type role now? I think it's, I think it's really important. I think the relationship between Alex Stewart and Michael Livinuto was massive. And there's some conversations that I think the, the director of cricket or high performance manager needs to protect the coach from. The coach is in the bunker with the players, in, you know, in, that, in that dressing room where you, you need to make sure that the, the coach can get everything they can out of the players. And when there's some conversations that need to be had, I think it's better being done by the director of, the, of cricket or the list manager, depending on the, on the, on the, the makeup. I think it gets hard when you set roles to individuals who maybe not their, their job spec might not meet up to who they are. So I think it's important to work out where the, the strengths lie in both captain, coach, and director of cricket. Um, because I think they're needed. I think they, the coach, the coach can take on too much and burn themselves out really quickly. Yeah. And you're seeing it in American sports, but also over here in our in our uh, winter codes, and especially AFL, where the the coach uh, won't. He may go on holiday after the season for three months and the team's put together by the list manager and they take a lot of stress away from the coach because they want that coach there for 10, 15 years, not for two to three years. So it's, it's working that out. I think England are on a really good system at the moment where first, um, first Straussie and now, now Jilo, uh, and then that interplay with Ed Smith uh, and then with the coaches and you know, World, World Cup winning side because of that. And then the trick is continually developing that. And... Now they're, they're doing that with the uh, you know with the academy with Mo Bavat, who's doing a great job then of piecing it all together. So there's a natural step process, and that way I think with those guys too, they're not doesn't they're not interested in being the boss. They just know they have to make boss decisions sometimes, yeah. and that's the that's what I probably learned from people like Stephen Fleming and uh, and Greg Shipper that you, you you get power so you can give it away rather than trying to trying to crave more and get more. Yeah. And the more you give up that, the more you can you can find the right answers and. 
I, I think it's a, it's a real mix that that's that's changes. It's very fluid. It changes from season to season and and from playing group to playing group. Yeah, of course. And I mean, you know, one of the things I've always found is for for a director of cricket sort of role that that getting the foundation foundations in place long term is yep. is the vital getting the right people around you. Now, in from English and county cricket, that's that's easier because it's a bit of a more long term strategy. You play as longer. Twenty twenty, you know, you, you could go to a tournament and nowadays you could literally be going. Twenty has sixteen players. You might not know thirteen of them. Go for it. So, how, how difficult would that? You know, what, how much? How, the top coaches nowadays in twenty twenty have to have that ability, and it is a completely different skill set to managing a, a four or five day team. So, how, how do you see that trend? It's difficult. I know from my Bangalore time and my Delhi time, but particularly Bangalore, uh, there was one year we finished third, and the next year we lost in the final, and we probably felt that we we uncovered the formula that's needed for for IPL. The following year, we had massive injuries. Kylie De Villiers both, both injured. Gail Watson, not in, not in great um, form at the time. Um, we're, we're some bowlers down. But we, we, didn't, we probably didn't plan enough for when there's, when there's problems. I, th- I think when, when you're getting that, that, uh, those groups of franchises together and, and Fleming and Jay Warden in the IPL situation have done it really, really well. It's what, it's what the, your franchise stands for. So it's understanding what the makeup is so you, you can, when you have a new person in, if it's 13 new faces, this is who we are. So this is what we are as a franchise. This is the style of cricket we'd like to play. This is what we do for our fans. This is, this is who we are. I think then it fast tracks that, that sense of culture, but also that, that understanding from a playing perspective, what's required of you. Um, not so much your role out in the middle, because st- strategy will be dictated to by conditions and, and, and team selection, but it's it's what you're playing for. So that you're playing, to use an old baseball cliche, but, you know, for the name on the front, not the name on the back. Yeah. And that and that's that's interesting. It's a, it's an art form. And yeah, coming back to the IPL, some, somebody like um, uh, Stephen Fleming's been the master at that. Um, and then somebody like a Darren Lehman, Tom Moody have, have been really good as well at doing that in the, in the places they've they've had immediate success by being able to make players feel like they're they're at home, they're at peace, they've found their, their spot, you know, now go and play and we'll bring the best out of you. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely, I think, I think sometimes franchise cricket gets pushed to the side, but the, yeah, the best coaches that I've been, I've worked with are, are involved in franchise cricket heavily. Sure, sure. And just going on to the 100, um, obviously real disappointment it got cancelled this year. Um, a, a couple of things I'd say, one is, you know, well, do you think it's still going to have a bright future next season? Are you still excited? Uh, also, do you think it could possibly challenge the IPL in the, in the future? I think it can. I, I, I say that because I, I'm invested in it, but I'm invested in it because I believe in it. And I think the 100 is, is a, a tournament that will be explosive for English cricket in that it will, it will, there'll be a buzz about. You have eight high-profile coaches. You've got lots and lots of really good players. That's just in England. You've got great players in England. Then all of a sudden you've got 24 overseas players, uh, of which maybe five or six uh, locals won't know that much of, but they will by the end of the tournament. Yeah. And then with people like Smith, Stark, Warner, etc., they they will bring a, a sense of professionalism to franchise cricket that maybe hasn't been seen yet. Um, the Blast is a great tournament, and the Blast with 18 teams, the standard is unbelievable. Yeah. It's the best fielding competition in the world for me. And the 100 now will offer something different for fans, for old fans, new fans, I think it will just raise that standard to another level for the English white ball side, but also from a test perspective and cricket perspective, it's generating new fans and will generate new fans. Once it does, you'll find that they'll, they'll have an understanding of test cricket as well. Yeah. They'll be supportive of, of English cricket as a whole, not just, not just the 100 itself. Um, and we've seen that from a big, bat, big batch perspective here, that it's giving, it's giving players an opportunity to strive for greatness and improve because there's... There's more money on offer, so players tend to float less because the better they perform, the harder they work, the more likely they're going to get a better payday. Yeah, sure, sure. And I mean, Jill, you, you, you're well known now as one of the game's most innovative thinkers. So, um, do, what is any other? This might scare a few people. Is there any other changes you'd like to see uh, in the in the in the coming years for cricket? Yeah, I think I think substitutions. I like, I like the idea, 
my, my big thing is putting coaches under pressure on match day. So that, so whether it's, um, you know, Fox Sports in Australia, whether it's Star Sports in India or whether it's Sky Sports in, in England, I, I want, I want the, the commentators to go down and make it about the coach for that short period of time, whether it's a strategic timeout or whether it's an important juncture of the game where there's a natural timeout. I, I want to hear what the coaches, how the coaches can influence games. And, and you, you see that in football and rugby. When, you know, when a player is pulled and they've made a, a substitution, just how much information is then poured into newspapers and websites and social media sites just on why coaches made that call. I think in cricket sometimes coaches just fold their arms and say, right, I've done my bit. It's almost not getting in the way of the players. But sometimes you need to get in the way of the players. It's, it's like the statistical thing about having hindsight. Yeah. It's, you, you, get, you get a little bit sick of when a coach says in a dressing room post-game, we should have done this and why didn't we do that? But if there's, a, if there's a little moment of game, and I, and I don't think by any measure I think coaches should be front and centre of, of um, sporting terms, but if there's, if there's times when coaches can influence games for both the good and the bad, I, I'd really like to see that. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And I've got to I've really got to pick your brains here and try, to, uh, try and get some key information out of uh, Trent Woodhill. Because obviously in England we're, we're sometimes a little bit backwards, and with um, drafts, of, you know, again it was quite scary. I know to a lot of the, the people in the game. So, as one of the experts, give me your draft strategy and what you're looking for an ideal makeup of a 2020. Well, definitely, definitely a fielding team, somebody who who can really put pressure on a on a batting side. Um, and then to, to help that fielding team, a bowling, a bowling team first and foremost. Um, you, I think you need, you need a bowling team that, that someone takes early wickets, spinners that can squeeze, squeeze in the middle, and then death bowlers who can, who can tidy up or put that much pressure on the batters that they're, if they're bowling, if your team's bowling first, batting, batting teams feel like they need more than what they actually do. Yeah. Um, if your team's, team's bowling second, your batting teams feel like they have to be further ahead of the game to deal with the late order threat. Yeah. And it's, it's a difficult list to manage because there's not as many great bowlers as there is great batsmen. So we tend to get, we get caught up in the sexy side of the, of the cricket when we go for the, the best batters rather than the best bowlers. But we found with one of your clients, with Sandu, Lamashane and Adam Zampa, you know, our, our, our thought was that we could have 10 overs of, of spin the last two seasons we've made the, the Big Bash final based on having the two best spinners in the competition. Yeah. Um, and last year we were better than the year before because we found good death bowling in, in Coulter Nile um, and, and, and obviously Harris Ralph. And so that was, that was great. The batting side um, fired without being spectacular. We had one player in Stoinis uh, and, 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 and support from Maxwell. And it showed that you know, bowling teams with a good fielding unit to, to help, is more likely, I think, to, to win big T20 games than, than an out-and-out -out batting side. Yeah, sure. And in terms of just some of your, your own personal experiences, which coach would you say has had the biggest influence on you? It's, it's, it's a really good question. I've been lucky, and I was, I think mentor, mentors are important. So I think it's important Regardless of where you feel you're at with your career, you need to find mentors. And that it doesn't mean you always have to find someone better than you. Um, it's finding people that can, can be honest with you. And I don't think I could name one, but I, I was like, I had Steve Rickson, who was at Surrey. And while Stumper didn't have a great time of it at, at, at Surrey, he, he guided me on, on being able to make the tough call and make, make tough decisions and being honest. Um, and then I was lucky to, to come across Greg Shippard um, in, that, in that experience with Delhi. And then there's a guy by the name Eric Simons who coached South Africa in the 2007, I think, World Cup. Yeah. Um, and he would end up coaching Delhi. And he's someone that I, I, I would always call to, to get a reassessment of my, my thoughts. And sometimes I'm, I've got off track because I, I haven't seen things the right way. But there's, there's, so, there's so many. And there's others who, who, who aren't even involved in cricket who can just guide you to make sure that you're making, you're making good decisions. And it's so so easy to, 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 to miss the small stuff that can take you off, off a long way off track. Sure, sure. And who, who would you say the most professional players you've, you've worked with? Well, this would be a surprise for a lot. It would be Kevin Peterson would be top three. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, close to 20 years we've been been working together and friends. And so you know, Delhi, uh, Melbourne Stars, and Sydney University, we we worked together. But Kevin always knew exactly what he needed to do to be ready to play. Yeah. And it was it was so easy that at times you could switch off when you shouldn't because you you knew exactly what he needed. So it was important to know what he was looking for. And, and if he if he achieved everything he needed, he was able to get out of there. Yeah. AB de Villiers was was sensational. Um, in that he, he's similar to Kevin but a different style. Come to training, short, sharp, consistent. So both guys in the time I was with them held their form incredibly well. Yeah. Then there, there, and there's others, um, Steve Smith, David Warner, Kane Williamson and Virat Kohli. Unbelievable trainers. They could train they could train forever and time wasn't a time wasn't a problem to them. They'd continue on until they, they got what they needed. But I think, I think too, some of the bowlers are incredible. Some, you know, someone like a, a Mitchell Stark, really good at, at getting what he, what he needed. And then from an England perspective, Chris Wokes, um, fantastic. Yeah. Wokes and, and Mo and Ali. Mo and Ali, just in terms of being able to have some fun at training and, and work really hard at where he wanted to get to. And then Chris Wokes, day in, day out, was just ready to go. So, yeah, you found that when, when he left training, you knew he was ready, whether he was in the, in the 11 or not. And if he got called up at the last moment, you weren't worried about him performing because he was, he's so professional how he prepares. Yeah, I mean, my next question, I think you just answered it actually. I, you've, you've worked with all of the, the, the top players in the world. I was going to say, what, what sets them apart? And it sounds from what you're saying, preparation and, and attitude. Is there anything else? I think it's, I think it's a little, there's a little bit of arrogance there, but I think it's, it's probably want of a better word is arrogance, but I, they have the ability to not be too perturbed by failure. Um, and if they're, if they're in a trot, they can dismiss that, not dismiss their opposition, yeah. but they, they will trust their judgment and they'll trust their techniques. Yeah. Um, I think coaches play a part in, in ruining more careers than, than helping, but that's, that's through trying to either change or see them in a light that they want to see them in. And the guys that I mentioned, they, they had complete ownership of the games and, and they were really good for coaches as a whole because they would tell you what, what they need to, to succeed. So as long as you're giving them what they need, they would stay consistent. But they, it's that ability to say no to either a senior player or a head coach um, and trust their own judgment. I think that's what's seen them all progress to be, you know, be world class. Excellent, great. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot. I want you to name one person, best batsman, Best bowler and best fielder in the world currently. Currently, best batsman. What format? Good question. We're going for for T twenty T twenty and red ball. You can have one for each. Okay, David Warner T twenty. Um, yeah. Seeing him firsthand in the IPL as a opposition coach was frustrating. Yeah. But he yeah, it was he you know, two, two I think three IPLs in a row. He had a year off for one, obviously, but. He was unbelievably dominant. If you dominate that tournament, there's a, there's a certain amount of class. He has the ability, it's like an inbuilt built computer to know when you're back first, what's a winning title, yeah. and when you're back, back second to, to orchestrate a chase. Um, yeah, there's, there's plenty of others. AB and you know, Glenn Maxwell for mine in terms of highlights packages. Yeah. But Warner, Warner from a T20 perspective. Okay. And, and long before, test much cricket. It's, it's, it's a three-way tie between Williamson, Smith and Coley. Oh, right. That's a cop-out. That. It is a cop-out because I, yeah, it's hard to go against Kane Williamson. Um, <laughs> Steve Smith's record is unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I, somehow I'd want, I'd want to fit all three of them in. <laughs> no problem. And bowlers? It's a good question at the moment. White ball, white ball Mitchell Stark, 27 wickets in the World Cup. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's a he he shades Rashid Khan by by millimeters. Yeah. But if you have one of those two, you're going to win more games than you lose. Yeah. You get fielders and any any good fielder. Yeah, there's a few. I mean, off their own bowling, Chris Jordan. Um, but then then there's there's some unbelievable ones. Uh, Glenn Maxwell, I think, would be my number one. He's he's taken over from AB De Villiers. He's eclipsed him now. Yeah. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's a yeah. You know, I'd probably go with yeah Jordan off his own bowling and and um, Glenn Maxwell. Okay. Those two. Who's just going up for the, the, the beaten path a bit? Who's the funniest person you've met in cricket? Daniel Vittori, which people laugh at me when I say that, but 
Daniel Vittori laugh, makes me laugh every day. Excellent. Okay. And if you could go back in time and watch any test series in the history of a game, who would, which would you choose? And also, which player would you like to go back in time and watch? I had the pleasure of working with um, Sir Vivian Richards at the Melbourne Stars. He's someone that I grew up watching, but I'd love to go back now just to appreciate him more. Yeah. The, the 76 test series, I, I think I tweeted that, that I would love to have watched the 76 test series in, in England. After Australia had beaten the West Indies in 5-1 in 75-76, the West Indies went to England and, and it, it was all set up for England. They had an older, older team and the West Indies just destroyed them. And you see highlights every now and then, but I would have loved to have been part of that test series yeah, from the outset, just to, just to have been around the, the, the West Indian fans just, and to see how, how you know, the great Richards did down wherever he got his 291. I would have been, would love to have seen that live. That would have been great. Great, great. And which, if you could, well, which country's sort of been the most uh, enjoyable for you to work in around the world? Oh, England, without doubt. Um, I love New Zealand. I love the New Zealand team and players. Australian cricket has an edge to it, and that's why it's so successful. So there's lots of times when it isn't enjoyable because it's it's edgy and it's it's performance related. Um, but England, England, that's you know that's where my heart is as a person. It's where my friends are. It's where I've spent a lot of my adult life. Um, and from a working experience, I've I've really enjoyed working with English players. Um, it was yeah, you know, I worked with Pakistan in the Champions Trophy in England, and that was great because of just that, that, that sense that playing cricket in England is undersold by people in England. Yeah. And, and w when we were sort of putting the 100 together, um, one of my things I'd said to, to the um, ministry who were putting it together was that you won't have to work too hard to get people to come to England to, to play cricket in the summer yeah. um, because the crowds are so knowledgeable and you can really f sense and feel their energy. There's a, buzz, there's a buzz about what's happening on the field not what's happening off, off it. And, yeah, you know, I, I, I think county cricket and international cricket in England is the, the, the pinnacle place to be when you're working. Fantastic. We'll hopefully see more of you over here then. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> and just, uh, you're a big Liverpool fan. Yep. So you're pretty happy at the minute? Very happy. Yeah, I wasn't too happy with Arsenal the other night, but, um, yeah, I would have liked to have scored more points than Man City. But, yeah, it's, I grew up watching, um, you know, Rush and, and uh, Craig Johnson, and we'd get one game a week for an hour <coughs> in the mid '80s, and it was usually Liverpool on because they were winning everything. So you'd you know, you'd watch the FA Cups live every year, and um, you'd, you'd get one one um, Division One game a week, and so it was natural for a lot of Australians my age to support Liverpool. And who'd have thought that you know it took 30 years to, to win championships? Yeah, well, that's what happens when you when you're a glory hunter, mate, and then you know it drops off. <coughs> you've, you've come back good now. Well, yeah, the other team's Huddersfield Town, so they're in a battle to avoid relegation for the second year in a row. But, yeah. yeah, did you watch Huddersfield a bit when you were out there? Yeah, I did. I went to a Boxing Day game and it was the coldest experience of my life. Um, I watched them a couple, a couple of times. Yeah, and Leeds, cold ground, mate, that is. Yeah, but Ellen Road as well. I've seen a few games at Ellen Road at Leeds, so I'm hoping they get back up in the, in the Premier League, which I know a few town fans won't like, but yeah, it's a soft spot for those two clubs. Great. What would be your dream uh, dream job in the world of sport? Would it, would it be Liverpool manager or just something, something, baseball? What would you choose? Any job in the world? It, without sounding too, uh, throwing cold water on your question, yeah. I'm, I'm always, I'm always um, dubious about people who say they've got their dream job because then I, I feel like they don't know why, they don't know when the right, right time is to leave it or they don't know what they're actually doing other than they love what they're doing. Yeah. But uh, the hundred, the hundred was was a dream come true without actually knowing. I, the early days of that working with the ECB and the conversations that we had on it, I, I was enthralled and I, I was enthusiastic and I, I lit a fire in me that I hadn't had for a while around around work and yeah. Um, yeah so that that is a that is a dream that is a dream job and hoping that that continues on and why because I love I love the innovation side. I, I love I love challenging coaches having having spent a lot of time with them and being one. And, and I, I like players to, to start thinking about the strategy side of it. And um, I, I think that when you add more innovation to the games, you, you figure out who the great captains are and who the great coaches are because they have to have, they have more to do. So that's, that's, that's part of it. But 
Yeah, I think I think there was. I think it's I think it's a tough question. I think I think it, it changes. I think one stage that would have been a caddy at the British Open, or yeah, it would have been been in the stands at Wimbledon. But it's yeah, I think I think it does change a fair bit, doesn't it? Yeah, oh yeah, very much so, very much so. Yeah, I, I, do, I thought you might have gone for like a baseball GM of a baseball team or something. I, I w- it would be good, but I think it would have been it would have passed me by because I don't think I'm as smart as those guys now. I think I think they're all you know, um, you know Ivy League college you know, um, mathematicians, and but that that would be great. It'd be, it'd be good. It'd be good doing a season of baseball, doing 162 games, and yeah, you know, being being with them when they actually start making the trades and. And Money, Moneyball, the movie, you know, obviously it's Hollywood, but the way that was, the way that, that movie was set out, it was it was a really interesting changing changing the guard. And to be in, to be involved with a with a baseball team is, would be would be fantastic. Brilliant, brilliant, Trent. I can't tell much appreciate your time. That is absolutely fascinating. Mm-hmm. I think it was I, I could keep you here all day with many more stories. So maybe, hopefully you'll join us again at some stage. And we'll look sure. into a few things a bit more deeply. But thank you very much for your time and take care, mate. My pleasure. Stay safe. Thanks. Hope you enjoyed our video with Trent. Uh, I thought it was absolutely fantastic insight into the game. As always, if you're if you like the channel, please hit subscribe and we look forward to seeing you shortly. Thanks, bye.